Welcome to the Arcady Group Thinkers podcast. I'm your host, Justin McCord, and with me is Ronnie Richard. Um, Ronnie, I talked about this in the episode, but just like before we introduce our guest, it's super interesting uh, to have conversations now with folks that I remember seeing from afar when I first got into the sector and thinking, oh man, I would love to pick that person's brain. Uh, and and our guest today is definitely one of those guys. Tell us a little bit about um, who we have on the show. Sure. We have uh, Steve McLaughlin. He's the Vice President of Client Success at SJ Consulting. He's a best-selling author of a book called Data-Driven Nonprofits, which published in 2016. And I mentioned that because we're going to touch on some of the differences between then and now uh, in our in our uh, episode here. Uh, but but Steve has more than 20 years of experience working with nonprofits around the globe um, in a variety of different aspects from analytics to products to client work, all, all these different aspects. Um, and I was struck in our conversation by he he went he mentioned this several times through a couple of different lenses of taking a theory of something and putting it into practice, whether that was um, somebody coming up with an idea and him saying, hey, let's try that. Or I think he's mentioned bugging his professors in college with what they would give him something and he would say, well, how does that apply? How, how can we put that into real life? So I, I found that pretty interesting in our conversation. Yeah, uh, definitely like the perfect positioning idea for someone that is um, a strong consultant and, uh, and, you know, conscience for the organizations that they work with whenever they're going to ask uh, those sorts of questions. Uh, and and bring that to the table of identifying something and then testing it out and verifying it to see if we're uh, focusing on the right areas. Focus is definitely something that comes up in this conversation um, quite a bit. And uh, something that I was very pleased that came up in this conversation uh, was a Peter Drucker quote, and uh, and that's that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Something that I've heard hundreds of times in my career. And every time I hear it, it's, uh, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's still true. And maybe never been more true. So, um, decade and a half in the making someone that I've always wanted to pick their brain. Uh, here is Steve McLaughlin on the Arcade group thinkers podcast. Okay. So I said that we should have hit record earlier. So I'm just going to repeat the starting point that I, uh, whenever I jumped on Steve, like, does it feel different or the same being like back in this, this sector proper from your, your brief experience out of and now back in? I feel like I didn't really leave, uh, the sector. Like I've been working with nonprofit organizations for probably 20 plus years now and in various, uh, stages of metamorphosis <laughs> career-wise. Um, and then most recently, I've been really just focused on the the higher education sector, which is its own little interesting animal uh, in the ecosystem. But yeah, it's great to be back working uh, every single day with nonprofit clients from a slightly different perspective. Um, you know, I started out my career in consulting back late 90s, early 2000s, uh, a lot of online, a lot of digital. Um, was supposed to go to law school, took a left turn at the internet and spent a lot of years in that world. And, and I had some for-profit clients along the way, but had some nonprofit organizations too. And so, um, except for some tax status things and other um, nuances, similar problems, similar challenges, right? How do we achieve yeah, what we're trying to get accomplished? And really from what I've been focused on for my, most of my career is what's the role that technology plays in that? How do we solve a problem or um, take advantage of an opportunity using technology? Um, it's really what, was what that, I've done. Yeah. What was that left turn at the internet? 
Like, well, Al Gore invents the internet, and then suddenly, uh, you just have a whole new way of being able to communicate and engage with people that didn't exist before. And so, I was supposed to go to law school, um, but when I was at college, I stumbled into this thing called the internet and started building online websites, learning HTML, all that stuff. And that just exploded, just took off um, in ways that hadn't expected and had a, had a point somewhere along the way of it was go to law school and forget about this internet thing and whatever. Um, had a job offer to go work for Accenture in Chicago um, which with obscene starting salary because I knew what I was doing and they were trying to take advantage of this online stuff, but just ended up doing a lot of, of online web work, um, late nineties, early two thousands, um, including some work with some nonprofits, um, spent some time working in higher education, went back and got a graduate degree, all that fun stuff. Um, and then spent, um, over 18 years at Blackboard, but working with nonprofits of all different shapes and sizes around the globe. Uh, and it was a lot of learning experiences. It was just a really great experience. You called it a metamorphosis of changing roles in different points of your career. And for our, for our listeners, I just want to run through some of them. You've done online design for websites like you were just describing. You've done project management. You've done data and analytics. You've been in products. You're in client success now. All these different roles, all these different changes as you were going through them and each time learning probably some new processes, learning some new ways of, of doing these jobs, which, what were some of the things that challenged you along the way as you were trying out these new roles and, and moving into these new duties that you had? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, just um, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um you know, it was, and this is true today, especially when I think about all oh, that's happening with artificial intelligence. Um, it, a lot of this reminds me of the early days of sort of the web and, and digital. Um, a lot of throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. You're making up as you go along. Um, but you ultimately fall back on, I think, certain principles that you know work, right? Uh you know, whether you're managing a project or you're trying to solve a problem, it may be new technology. There may be a lot of unknowns. You may be still trying to figure stuff out, but you still go back to you know, what's the goal? What's the objective here? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, okay, let's that be our North Star for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, how are we going to track our progress against whether we're being successful or not? So none of that, none of that's new. I mean, that's stuff's been around for decades or hundreds or thousands of years in some way. We're just applying it to um, new technology. I think the other thing I learned along the way was personally figuring out what am I good at and where can I hire or bring on people who are better, smarter, faster at these things than I am, right? I started out building designing websites. Then I hired designers who were infinitely better designers than I would ever be or developers who were better developers than I ever would be. Um, and then could focus more on what are we trying to accomplish? How are we driving that outcome as opposed to hands-on keyboard writing code? Um, you know, I, I, I know what the code looks like. I know how it operates. I know how it works. You don't want me getting anywhere near that, but I understand it enough to figure out, are, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Is this going to be successful? Um, and similar when I did a lot of work with data and analytics, um, we weren't supposed to talk about this topic, but I'll bring it up. So I'm a decalculus student. I have no business dealing with all the data and data analysis stuff that I've dealt with in my career, strictly speaking from a mathematical <laughs> perspective. But I've worked with data scientists who absolutely like, you know, I know what a regression is. Um, data scientists know how to run that. I know what endogeneity is. I know where you get into problems with data. I can't fix that with my hands on a keyboard, but I understand it enough to know that when I'm talking with data scientists or talking with analysts, how to guide and how to direct them. So I think part of it was knowing enough about the subject matter to have street cred with the people you work with, but 
you know, but I can't do it, right? I can't build a data model with 18 different variables in it and, you know, produce the right outcome. But I can help guide a group of people to get to that destination. And I can ask questions about how do we know? How do we validate it? How do we know for sure this is working? So that's been one of the key skills, I think, over the years to to pick up, right? Have natural sense of curiosity, like really be very curious about how does something work? How might we get something to work? Used to drive my professors in grad school crazy because I was always trying to take the theory and apply it. Wow, that's an amazing theory. Someone did a research study on how can we actually apply that? And that's pretty much what I've been doing for the past 20 plus years is that's an interesting idea. Let's find out if it works or not. How would we test it? How would we apply it? How do we adjust uh, and move on from there? Yeah. The, uh, I find it fascinating, uh, your admission of your calculus uh, grade and, and calculus cred. But then also, you know, I got to tell you, like, uh, when I came into the sector, you know, close to a decade and a half ago, um, you were uh, you were one of the, at the time, um, early for me, at least early thought leaders, that was your very, you had a very public persona around uh, data and analytics. And it would be, it was easy for me to see that persona and think, man, this dude is the wizard on the keyboard. Uh, And so I I just love the idea that like, as you're saying, maybe a little bit of your, your superpower that you have honed in over the time has been, um, being the person to connect and translate uh, and tie together versus being the per- the person in the connections uh, and in the translations, um, that kind of aspect. Um, you, uh, you published your book, Data-Driven Nonprofits, in 2016. You're almost a decade past that uh, that book originally being published, which is probably, you know, a thread that we can go down. Um, What's changed since then, since 2016? Wow. That's a, that's a great question. What's changed? Uh, Let me start with what hasn't changed and then I'll, I'll switch gears and actually answer your question. So what hasn't changed is data is still an immensely important asset for nonprofit organizations. And the only reason I wrote that book was no one else had uh, tackled the subject in a way that would work for nonprofits. So as the more work I was doing with data and analytics, I kept asking, you know, what would you read? What would you, how would, how would other people figure out how to embrace this more? And there really wasn't anything. And so that's partly what led to, to writing the book and some things that just haven't changed since then it's data is still important. Um, And it's in a lot of cases undervalued or underappreciated organizations. Um, And you don't have to be a data scientist and you don't have to be someone who writes your own algorithms and does your own models to be able to get, to get, to get value from it. Um, From a leadership perspective, whether you're a leader of a department or a team or you're the executive director or the CEO of an organization. It's more now of uh, how do you understand the potential for data and what it can help lead to insights in your organization's breakthroughs? And then how do you create a culture that uh, makes it work? And that would be, so the data, so the thing hasn't changed. Data is still super important. Two, uh, one of the big conclusions from the book is there's no secret sauce uh, over what makes organizations really successful, the use of data versus those that struggle, other than a lot of it just comes down to organizational culture. Yeah. Um, are you in a c- culture that um, thrives on change, experimentation, getting to the result, right results? Um, that has not changed, right? What's the old adage from Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast? Still true, mm-hmm. right? Um, th- that has not changed. What has changed, or if there was a updated edition, or even in some of the updated talks that I do these days based on some of the content from the book, is I introduced the fact that we now need to move from just looking at the data to turning that data into information 
and turning that information into insights. Like we've got to, we got to level up, right? Uh, the book was about how do you get to the base level of where you and your organization need to be. Now we, we need to move beyond just the data. We've got to move to turning data into information and information um, into insights. And then obviously the, the second big thing um, is the artificial intelligence uh, whirlwind that we're living in. Yeah. Um, you know, I've talked about this in the past, you, you know, AI, AI is not new. Um, there's experimentation with AI that goes back to the 1950s where they were translating um, languages. It's just, and it's gone through a bunch of dips and dives and peak of inflated expectations. Uh, and here we are now, right? We're 20 years past Clippy. Clippy was AI, it's crappy AI, but it was it was AI. And now if you look around the world we live in today, it's right. uh, all the digital assistants we live in. It's all the language translation. Um, it's the things like chat GPT. Um, AI obviously is, is a big, is sort of a, a bigger inflection point that we're living through right now. Although I believe we're, in, we're approaching the hype peak of inflated expectations and if this is like any other technology curve, we're going to, there'll be, you know, we're going to go to ride the downslope for a little bit where people will yeah. say, well, I thought AI was going to solve all my fundraising problems, uh, make my grass greener and allow me to achieve my goals and objectives. You know, this stuff's crap. It's not working. Likely because we've, we've inflated the expectations for other reasons we could get into, but, but AI is, is an inflection point that we're at today for sure. Ultimately, AI, um, any type of artificial intelligence, whether we're talking about machine learning or uh, large language models, it's all based on the fact that you feed it a lot of data and it develops patterns and it does things. And so we still come back to, at the end of the day, just saying to some clients last week, at the end of the day, no matter what happens or doesn't happen with AI, it's going to be the quality of the AI is based on the quality of the underlying data, right? You get yeah. bad data results in bad robots. We get the Terminator because of bad data. If yeah. we get bad AI in the nonprofit sector, it will be down to bad data in large part. Yeah. The man, first of all, well done on the Drucker reference. Uh, <laughs> I don't think enough people live off of that uh, in the way that they think about their organizations. Like it's so, so true that culture eats strategy for, for breakfast over and over and over. Um, something that I find interesting, I would love your take on is you're right that the, uh, that data and data culture, like the need for that has not changed. Data has evolved and now we have a better sense on structured data and a massive amount of unstructured data in so many different areas. Like, and now I'm thinking about specifically in the way that a nonprofit goes to market in their fundraising efforts, like all the unstructured data that lives in point solutions and on post-it notes on people's mm -hmm. desktops and yeah. like all over the place. And so it's like, uh, in some ways, I feel like we haven't figured out how to even be our best at data culture because data has evolved and spun out into so many additional forms of usefulness now. And we're still trying to figure out like the foundational forms of the structured data that we do have around transactions and demographics and promotional history and those sorts of pieces. Yeah, there's a lot of time today still spent on the highly structured data. You know, the where did that data come from? What's the quality of that data? How are we using it in reporting? How are we using it in segmentation? How are we using it to determine who do we engage with at what time using what channel and what was the result that you're right? We, we spent a lot of time doing that that prevents us from getting into the unstructured piece, which was you know, what's the tonality of our messaging and are there certain types of supporters where this tone resonates better than other, other things that we've tried before? Um, in some ways, AI technology can help answer those, 
those questions for sure. Um, and with a lot of these things, right? Technologies, technology is no longer the limiting factor. You know, this mm-hmm. isn't. We're not talking about flying cars and food pellets and the Jetsons here. We're not talking about things that are some futuristic world that you should imagine and wait for. Most of this is with us today. And in fact, in, in many cases has been around for, for quite a while. Um, it's just, you know, certainly, and I see this today, um, you know, at SJ Consulting, where there's not a day that goes by where I don't work with a client about some project that we're working on. And I, I see a little bit of the other side of the fence, which is all of these organizations are uh, enabled and powered with amazing technology, but they still just have a lot of things that they're trying to accomplish. And um, sometimes it, it's a challenge, right? How do we, how do we, we have all these things that we need to do. How do we prioritize our time, our resources, our effort to focus on the things that are likely to yield the best results? And that's often easier said than done, despite the fact that we have all of this, uh, this technology. Um, we, there are still limitations to how much um, change we can drive or how much uh, time or energy we can put into any one of our initiatives. Do you think the reception of the message that you were putting out in the book about the importance of data and, and the importance of it in the nonprofit sector, has the reception of that message changed? I feel like we all know now the importance of data. Was that back when you wrote that in 2016, was that, did you feel like that was a a message you had to get out there and tell them that, Hey, you need to pay attention to this. And now it's more, I'm glad you're paying attention to this, but now let's take it to the next level. Could could be a bit of that. I mean, I was the, the audience for the book was not the person who was already a member of the choir and already could, you know, sing all the notes and knew exactly that this is what had to happen because that's, that they already know it. Mm-hmm. Um, the audience was those who don't understand this are confused by it, want to understand it better. I mean, one thing, and I think Justin, you touched on this, if there's one superpower skill I've developed over 20 plus years is how to take really complicated, gnarly concepts and simplify them for people to understand because that's what I have to to do with it, right? I take these complex things, man, this doesn't make This doesn't make sense. How does this work? How does this work? Oh, that's how this works. Gotcha. Because, uh, again, trying to translate in non-technological terms to the rest of us um, is is really valuable, especially when, you know, decision makers, people who are in leadership roles, often they're not, um, it's not tech savvy. Like we're all tech savvy. That's, that's over, that term's overused. It's just having a, a sense of how do you connect the dots? Like why, so what, who cares? Steve, why does this matter? Um, and so yeah. even to this day, taking simple examples of, well, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not convinced all this stuff always matters all the time. And so oftentimes you've got to quantify it in stories that resonate. And the one I use to this day is still um, just misspelling your donors' names make a difference. Don't know. We should go find out. Well, it turns out we did some research and we found out that when you misspell donors' names, uh, you lose 10% of them through um, retention. And those who keep giving to you, despite the fact that you misspell their name, uh, give you 12% less. Hmm. Now, somebody finally wants to have a conversation about the quality of data and typos and how do we do a better job? Because now I suddenly know what it's costing me. And with a lot of things, you know, it's fair statement. If you can't tell me how this is helping me or how this is costing me, I got a lot of other stuff going on, Steve. Uh, I got to move on to another topic. Now, suddenly, wow, that's a lot. That's And that's totally curable, totally preventable um, thing. But it's a culture thing because there's no vice president of typos at your local nonprofit who makes sure that all this stuff gets done correctly. It's everyone's job, which is a cultural thing. And so that's just one example of when you paint that in a very understandable, graspable, graspable, (laughs) grappable, whatever the word is, uh, story that's based on real true research, then people like, okay, wow, 
Got it. And then it turns out, what else? <laughs> okay, we fix typos. Uh, pay attention to that. What else would we do that maybe we're not doing today, right? Um, the I totally with you on it. I think it's funny as you're sharing that just about even like typos. Um, we had an event in the spring that we did and we brought clients together and we brought other industry folks together and uh, we had a, a block of hotel rooms and uh, and we had a member of our team who had organized those hotel rooms and had been working primarily with the the hotel and um, we had some important guests when when they checked in the beginning of their experience was jarring because as they got into their room it didn't say welcome steve on their screen it said welcome pam like it, it had the member it had our team member's name and it's so interesting like it was such an important event that even out of the gate we were putting ourselves at at some level of quantifiable risk by something so small and as you're talking about it, man, I just, I can't help but think that um, the way that we get better today around data focus is the same as it was in 2016 or in 2006. And we still haven't figured it out. And it's, it's about like focus, like <laughs> to your point about, you know, a leader who's making decisions and, uh, they don't need to be under the hood uh, ex uh, inspecting how a carburetor is performing. They need to understand the insight from said performance so that they can make whatever decisions that they need to make. Someone else needs to focus on the performance of the carburetor. And it seems like there may be in our exceptionally uh, pressure packed sector at the moment that it may be more difficult to focus on enabling data culture than uh, than it ever has been. It could be, you know, the word culture, admittedly, has a lot of weight placed on it. Um, and even there, I would, you know, simplify culture is is beliefs, habits, and routines. Culture is what happens when no one's looking in your organization. When no one's looking, do you make sure that uh, the gift entry process is solid? Do you make sure that the stewardship and acknowledgement is working the way it's? I mean, do you do these things when no? If no one was looking, would you still do it this way? That's at a high level of of performance. And there's ways to check on that, but like that's you know those are the things you got to look at across the board. Um, and I think part of it too is just you know the ability. There's so this is true of every organization, regardless of your tax status, right? Uh, there are a lot of organizations where decisions are made based on personal preference, right? Uh, we. Sometimes we call this the hippo problem, the highest paid person's opinion, right? Why, why is the why is the newsletter purple and green, and why do we do this this particular way? Well, because the hippo, you know, writes the checks and signs the checks, and so we just go along, get along, and so we just do it this way, right? We've always done it this way, or someone has said this is how they want it to, to be done. So a lot of it is is driven by um, personal perspective. And the, the element that data brings to this is that, well, we actually have some statistical, statistically significant proof about what works and what doesn't work. And I'm sure you've seen this. There are a lot of things in the sector that are still driven by, well, this is how we do it, right? Mm -hmm. Or, and, and one of the things I did when I wrote the book was, because uh, I'm a bit of a history buff, was digging back into like, why does modern fundraising work the way it works? Well, it works the way it works because of how it was largely designed and invented in the early 1900s. And except for the fact that we've added technology, most of the practices come out of early 1900s philosophy, right? 
set a goal, be date driven, uh, engage with people, follow up, have a clear um, mission statement, uh, organize things this way. Like that's that's not new. That's over 100 years old at this point. What's new is we have the technology that enables us to say, well, is that working? <laughs> is yeah. that the best approach that we should potentially take? Or perhaps we should look at the data to inform our decision making. I'm not saying turn all the all the decision making over to the robots, but at least use data to inform our decision making to say, should we continue to do something in this way just because we always have versus taking a look at um, what the, what is the data? What does the data tell us? And I'll give you a, a perfect example I've been talking about a lot lately with clients and and when I speak and, and do workshops. So I've lived through this. I'm sure you have too. There's been a raging battle for 20 years over online versus offline. Yeah. And it's usually jets and sharks. You know, it's the offline people versus the online people. And, uh, you know, you show me your organization chart and I can probably show you where the dysfunction is or why this isn't working. But as it turns out, the online versus offline argument largely is pointless. Um, the retention rates for both on um, first year donors are bad. Um, it's just bad. Right. Uh, and so if you do a little bit of research or maybe uh, drink my own champagne here. If you take the data, turn the da data into information, then push it a little bit more and get to an insight, what you'd find is having discussions about online versus offline are almost entire. We're talking about the wrong thing. Um, that, that if we're looking at how, if, if the problem that we're trying to solve is how do we dramatically improve donor retention then just looking at online versus offline is looking at the wrong thing. It turns out there's something else in the data that has a much more profound difference, which is looking at the difference between the ways in which people give, not the channels they use. Because as it turns out, the channel of engagement and the channel of transaction is largely irrelevant when it comes to donor retention, right? The thing we want to achieve. And so what the data reveals is, we should really be having a conversation about single gift versus recurring gift donors because recurring gift donors have a, a, re, a first year retention rate in the 70 percent and single gift donors are still stuck in the 20 percent where the, that's a pretty big gap that's a gap yeah. enough to say this isn't happenstance and we're not talking about the difference between pink paper and brown paper. And we're not talking about the difference between online versus offline. Like that's a big Delta. Something must be happening here. And yet we'll get into a cultural battle where an organization will say, I, 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 I only know this single gift world. That's the world I came from. That's all I know. It's all I know how to do. You're now in coming in here, Steve, telling me we need to build out a recurring gift program. I don't know a whole lot about that. Therefore, I don't want to change despite the mm -hmm. fact that the renewal rate, the lifetime value rate, all the metrics that you would want to be in positive territory are astronomically better with recurring donors. I'm going to just stick to what I know. Like, <laughs> that's where all of this stuff comes together, right? Where it's a, is. it's a data issue. And yet when you present people with these facts and you say, the, the discussion is no longer online versus offline. No one cares. It's, it's largely irrelevant. You're doing a crappy job at both either way. Um, what you probably should look at in the data is the fact that building a recurring gift donor program will yield all these positive benefits. But the one side effect or one catch is you're likely going to have to change how you operate today, how you do things today. And that's scary. Um, that's that's uncomfortable to people, especially if, if you know, cranking the machine and just knowing how that machine operates is is all you really really know it can be it can be intimidating for sure yeah yeah it's a it's a big cultural change and it's a big change in a lot of different ways because even thinking about how you budget you know we we talk about budgeting now often is this amount goes to online this amount goes to direct mail versus let's think about how we're budgeting to reach new donors how are we budgeting to talk to recurring donors right i mean it's it's a whole, I mean, almost, I don't want to say blow up the system, but it's, it's, 
a big rearrangement, right? Definitely can be a big rearrangement, especially again, if you're just not organized from leadership to everyone who works on this stuff to be clear about what is it we're trying to achieve here and what are the tools that are available to us that we're going to leverage to, to drive that result. And yes, there will be change and yes, we will make mistakes and yes, occasionally we will get it wrong, but we can look at the, we can look at the reports to tell us whether or not we're achieving a, a better outcome or not. Otherwise, and again, look, I, I'm I'm well past this. Um, I can write as many pages as I want. I can do lots of talks. We can do podcasts like this. This is fun. I'm under no illusion or delusion that everyone will listen to this and everyone will immediately go and do these things because th that's not how the world operates. But there will be organizations, there will be somebody out there who hears this or reads something or picks up on something from a talk and says, you know what, I'm going to try that one thing, see if that works. And that's forward progress. Um, and, and certainly, you know, there are organizations who run amazing fundraising programs today who know a lot of this and, and who are doing this stuff today. Um, and oftentimes, those are the ones that I look to to find out where, where's the innovation happening? Like what are the organizations who already do an amazing job at a lot of this? Those are the ones I love to talk to, to find out what are you guys experimenting with right now? Well, we're trying this to see if, okay. Cause likely that is a, that's a next practice that 10, 15 years from now probably becomes best practice because yeah. someone's already out there trying to attempt to do it. Right. But it's based on the results, right? Um, and that is, a, I think, a definite thing that's changed in the past decade is uh, a much more higher focus on let's measure the performance of how something works and decide whether we should continue to do it or whether we had to pivot and, and change direction. Steve, I don't know. I, I kind of want to believe that everyone that listens to this is going to immediately change how they budget and uh, and how they, they think about data uh, and... Um, I don't know if it's on uh, on your radar, but uh, uh, you know, a uh, whether or not you do a uh, updated version of the book uh, as you hit a ten year mark, or you create a podcast that is the updated version of the book. <laughs> uh, just want to uh, edify you to continue beating the drum uh, because it matters and. Uh, and and we're thankful for the leadership that you've had in the the sector over these past two decades and continue to have uh, now visiting with individual uh, organizations and helping them see that vision because it is this is a this is our own point of inflection and so it's a important moment and um, we're thankful for your part in it and for you to spend some time chatting with us about your journey today. Yeah, really appreciate it. Uh, no promises on <laughs> new books or anything else, but uh, absolutely will continue to be a champion for um, ways that organizations can improve. And um, I get a lot of both personal and professional enjoyment out of it. So we'll continue to, to do that drum solo in the sector. Well, you got a lot of, uh, you got a lot of fellow drummers, right? And so we're, uh, we're, we're creating our own little, uh, I don't know if it's a drum line because we're, we tend to be at different parts at different times, but, um, but, uh, I know that we take a lot of solace in knowing that there are other folks that share that same, uh, spirit and passion for, uh, the progression, uh, of, of what we're doing and how we're doing it. So good to catch up, man. We, uh, yeah, we here. appreciate the opportunity. To, yeah. For, uh, continued conversation on this and we'll talk to you again soon. Party. Thanks, guys.